All right, guys, welcome back. We'll jump right into it here, talking about the Xbox Activision Blizzard acquisition. Just a quick piece of news. It has been approved again in another country, and that country is South Africa. It says here, merger alert. The competition tribunal has unconditionally approved the proposed merger, which is a global transaction whereby Anchorage Merger Sub, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Microsoft. Weird how that's the name of it there. It tends to acquire Activision Blizzard. So they approve it. They're unconditionally approving it. There are no remedies that has to go through. And that's just another country that has gone ahead. Still waiting on New Zealand. And then obviously with the FTC preliminary injunction decision is going to be and the appeal from the uh, in the UK with the cat. So we'll see what happens with all that stuff. But South Africa here is another positive for the Xbox side in terms of an approval. Now, let's talk about the Xbox showcases. So Xbox showcases over the last, I would say, three years, they've kind of been trying different things. So two years ago, they did the lots of CGI, not enough gameplay. A lot of people complained about that. I wasn't a fan of that show where there was a lot of CGI and barely any gameplay. And then last year, they did the whole 12-month thing. And besides the fact that they didn't deliver on all of the games that they had announced coming out in the next 12 months... I actually really did enjoy that show and it seems like I'm in the minority on that, but I liked the fact that they showed a ton of gameplay and gave us a look as to what we can expect in the very near future for Xbox. I think they still delivered on like 75% or so of the games that they said were going to come out in the, in the next 12 months, but that brought a lot of scrutiny because there were major games that got delayed, like the Red Falls, like the Starfields, and then the Red Fall debacle just added to that scrutiny. Then we had this year's show, and I think this year's show is literally the perfect combination. It took them two years to get to a show that will satisfy pretty much everybody. I don't really think there were very many complaints with this show. We saw games that are coming out soon. We saw games that are going to be coming out in the future, and it was all apparently either in-engine or actual gameplay of these games. So I think it was really well done. And what they did do at the end of the show, as we know, was the Starfield Direct. And it was a very long Direct. It gave us a huge deep dive, basically going into the majority of the things that mechanics within the game that you're going to be able to play with this, with Starfield when it is released. And I thought that the Direct itself was very, very good. Now on Twitter, the other day, there was some back and forth here. I think it was Tim Dog who asked Phil Spencer about showcases and what they're going to be doing for upcoming showcases in terms of the developer direct format. And Phil Spencer actually replied, and this is what Phil Spencer says, on the dev directs, I really like the format, whether it's one game deep dive like Starfield or more games like the January show, I think it's good to spotlight the creators and hear their vision. And the January show is actually very good too, as I think there was maybe four or five games that they went into where they actually went over to the development studios and you saw the people making the game deep doing deep dives into the games that were coming out and that's where we saw the hi-fi rush shadow drop which was great and when it comes to again the starfield direct i thought that was awesome to see and i would love to see xbox going forward as games are getting closer to their release have 30 minute showcases up to 45 minutes or whatever deep dives into the gameplay and getting people ready for these games to come out like for example forza motorsport coming out in october it would be really cool if they just did a developer direct going deep into the mechanics of that game, the improvements over the last Forza Motorsport and on all that type of stuff. I think that would be an awesome thing to do. And then even going forward into the upcoming years for big games that are coming out, like maybe the next Gears, maybe Perfect Dark, maybe Fable, all that type of stuff. I think developer directs are great ways to really show off that these games are far in development and there is a lot of progress going on and this is what you can expect because the, although gameplay within these showcases are great to see, they're all, a lot of times is very, very short and you don't get an entire idea as to all the stuff you're going to be able to do within each specific game. So that'll be interesting to see if they break it up more, have more developer directs and maybe smaller showcases rather than trying to put everything into a single big showcase. I think that will be more along the lines as to kind of what Nintendo does and even what PlayStation does with, with their showcases overall. It's like always good to have a mix. So we'll see if anything comes up in the next year or so for games that are supposed to be releasing, like maybe there will be an avowed developer direct coming up sometime soon. Now, when it comes to the gaming industry, 
we know mobile gaming is is something that these big companies want to get into. I'm not a fan of mobile gaming. We have talked about it because it's going to be a part of Xbox. It's the main reason they're saying they're buying Activision Blizzard. They want to try to build out a, an Xbox mobile store to compete with Apple and Google. And PlayStation is doing the exact same thing. This isn't a strategy that Xbox is undertaking, trying to do something different or be ahead of PlayStation when it comes to this. I think PlayStation as well. I mean, they aren't stupid. They see how important mobile gaming is for making money and it is something that can allow you to fund all of the big triple a style of games now playstation mobile they had announced that they were working on a bunch of games for specifically mobile and pc or a lot of their games will be coming over to mobile and pc and this was going to be happening by 2025 jim ryan saying that the company expected half of its annual releases to be on PC and mobile by 2025. And as we know, they have to do that. And one of the main reasons they have to do that, we'll get into it as well in, a, in another article here, is because of the actual development costs of PlayStation games or just video games in general. It's not just PlayStation, but of the big AAA games, they have to expand out, which is why I think the Xbox strategy is the smarter strategy and why we're seeing PlayStation kind of adapt towards that, which is putting games on multiple different devices and not just locking them to the console itself. But when it comes to PlayStation Mobile, they have actually lost another top executive. This is here. It's reported by MobileGamer.biz that Mikhail Katkov, who is the managing director of the recently acquired Savage Game Studios and don't forget, PlayStation has been acquiring studios, albeit smaller studios, but it is set them up as well for the transition to a new strategy like you think about bungie games as a service you think about savage game studios it's for mobile gaming and it says here that i'd like to believe i've done my fair part in taking the company from zero to one and this is what mikhail kakoff is saying on linkedin it says now i'm eager to watch some the side as najim and mike take it from one to 100 in the same breath i wish nothing but the best to oliver Court March and Chris Davis, who are leading PlayStation's charge on to mobile. And I can't wait to play all the amazing games from all the fantastic developers. So right there, calling it out that they're going hard onto the mobile scene and there's going to be lots coming. And Savage Studios is a new studio that was established in 2020 and was co-founded by veteran mobile developers Katkov and Najim Adjur and Michael McManus. So, I mean, Najim from Rovio as well, which is a huge studio. Now, this isn't the first time that this has happened recently with PlayStation as they have acquired people from all across the mobile gaming industry. It says SE has quietly built a team of experienced mobile talent, hiring people from Apple, Kabam, Meta, Tencent, Super Evil, Megacorp, Samsung, Niantic, Zynga, Riot, and more. So there you go. I mean... This is uh, a, a, probably a blow to them, but it also just shows at the same time how deeply they're trying to push forward the mobile gaming side with the PlayStation Mobile app, with PlayStation Mobile games, probably going to be seeing spinoffs of some of their bigger titles, some of their more prominent IPs to just get people wanting to download and play those games. And we'll see if maybe they're going to go out and acquire more studios from mobile gaming and obviously try to hire some more top executives. And again, mobile gaming, the expansion into it and the expansion into PC gaming is a must at this point, I think for these big triple a games for these big companies like PlayStation and Xbox, if they want to be able to sustain the budgets of making some of the games that they are making. And we can see that here as there was during the Xbox versus FTC case, some ridiculous, supposedly supposed to be redacted information that was crossed out with a sharpie then the document was scanned and we got that information because it came up because they didn't redact it properly and that had to do with the actual development budgets for some of playstation's big triple a games the last of us part two and i believe horizon forbidden west and it says here that both games took more than five years and more than 200 million dollars to develop it took 300 employees working from 2017 to 2022 to make horizon forbidden rest at, at a cost of 212 million well naughty dog peaked at 200 studio employees as it spent 220 million over 70 months now we have some other people within the industry chiming in on this saying that these types of budgets are not sustainable. First of all, we have former Psychonauts 2 developer Lizette 
Montgomery. I'm not, there's a, some of these names are very hard to say, so I just kind of say them the best I can. But Lizette Titra Montgomery. I'm not sure if I said that right. So that well, after hearing this, Sony spent $220 million over six years to make The Last of Us Part Two. Says that game teams this size for this long are not sustainable. They also have former, former Capcom and Xbox producer Shanna put that in perspective, pointing out that it means a studio was spending $15,000 a month per employee on average, which obviously that doesn't translate into the salaries of this employees, but just the overall overhead cost to keep them employed with everything that comes with that. I mean, equipment, the bills, the rent, all that stuff. Right. And that's about a rate of 3 million per month. And then we have Bungie producer, Nigel Davis pointing out that, these salaries are actually below the market rate in terms of the tech industry. If they were in other parts of tech, they may be getting paid more. So you can kind of foresee potentially the actual budgets of a lot of these games increasing as we go forward, as they become bigger, as the technology becomes more powerful, like 220 is a massive number, but that's not an unheard of number. We've seen many games get over hundreds of millions of dollars for budget. And as these games become more complex, that number is just going to continue to grow. But there was another thing here that was actually very interesting. And it's when they talk about the actual delays of these games. And a lot of people, we look at games and we're like, just delay it, just delay it. If it isn't ready. The reason why you're re we're realizing now that they can't always just continuously delay games, why it is bad, why they have to eventually put them out there. And why sometimes they just bite the bullet and put it out there. I feel like Redfall was one of those games is because it costs this amount of money every single month to keep these games in development, to keep this amount of employees on there. After a game gets released, I'm sure they cut back on some of the resources that go into it. But that's why we do see some games get pushed down. You ask yourself, why did they push this game out rather than delay it another six months, another year or whatever? And it's because of the actual costs every single month that are so high to keep these massive budgeted games going. And when we look at The Last of Us Part Two and horizon it it isn't out that crazy out of the ordinary i mean i saw these numbers and i thought they were big i'm like these are huge budgeted games and it also explains why playstation knows that they can't sit back and continuously just put these games out only on the playstation 5 console that's why we're seeing a lot of first party games get released on pc and i think we'll start to see that more and more and even in a shorter time frame than they currently do it because the budgets continue to grow but we take a look here at some of the biggest games in terms of the amount it took to make them a bit red dead redemption 2 this was something that we saw this number come out 540 million dollars to make which is insane but they made over what was it, a couple billion dollars back on it so they they made their money back plus some but we look at the top this is from 2021 and these are some of the top five games here in terms of how much it costs to develop you have star citizen which crazy as it's cost 320 million and counting and I, and I don't think that game has been very successful so far cyberpunk 2077 316 million so if you think about that and they released it and there was all of the controversy around that release they're probably sitting there thinking do we put this game out in the state that it is in specifically because it really is just the worst on the ps4 and the xbox one console and you can get by playing it on the series x and i think the ps5 had a bit more issues and pc had issues but you could get by with it it wasn't great and it was still unfortunate they released it in that state but you could get by playing that game on those those more powerful hardware they probably were sitting there thinking let's put it out there let's get the insane backlash that we're going to get but we have to be able to stop bleeding all of this cash for the development now there wasn't crazy backlash there was insane backlash for cyberpunk 2077 but they did eventually make their money on that game they did eventually be very successful so i mean it was bad because they lied about a lot of stuff in terms of having this game run the way that they said it was going to run especially on the ps4 and the xbox one but there, the reality is gamers still bought the game they still made their money so they didn't really feel any consequences for that. Now we have here Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, $250 million, according to the escapists. That's crazy. And Call of Duty and, and Activision puts that out every single year. It's a yearly release. This is in a five, six year span before these games come out every single year. They're putting in that much probably to make these Call of Duty games. And they make that back very easily because it is the most selling game every single year, most popular game. So 
it, that's insane. And you can see Xbox looking at Call of Duty as well and thinking about the amount of cash they'll rake in from that. Then Grand Theft Auto V took $265 million, And of course, Rockstar Games, Grand Theft Auto, Red Dead Redemption make all of their money back. So I think this is just a very interesting discussion on the actual development costs of these games and why certain decisions do have to be made and why we are seeing the expansion away from console exclusivity. There's just not enough consoles that will ever be out there in for these massive AAA games to be made. And then it'll be interesting to see how much it costs to make a Nintendo game because I feel like the development costs for some of these first party Nintendo games are significantly less than the $200 million mark which also kind of puts it in a different category, I guess, when it comes to the decisions that Nintendo is going to be making going forward with how they're going to be running their ecosystem. But I will leave the video there, guys. If you did enjoy this video, hit that thumbs up. If you are new here, hit that subscribe, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.